and welcome to another Sonic Lab. Today we're looking at, well, it's a Mac Mini. It's the Mac Mini with the new M1 silicon in it. Now, why on earth are we looking at this? We don't review computers. And you'd be right, um, the reason we are is Apple got in touch with us and said, would you like to take a look? And you know, when Apple get in touch with little guys like us, it makes you feel good and warm inside. And you also think, ooh, maybe we'll be able to get a discount. No such luck. <laughs> this goes back uh, probably in a week's time. Uh, there's no journalistic discount. There's no, we can't buy this unit. It has to be sent back. So there's no kind of benefits to us apart from we get to look at the brand new silicon. And this is causing a bit of a big deal because the new silicon is the Mac Mini, new guts, new, new glory, small chip, giant leap. This is the M1 chip or a representation of it. It has all, it's called system on a chip, SOC is what they call it. And as such, everything is built into the same silicon. So we have the GPU cores, we have the CPU cores, there's also an AI section, security, all this stuff built into the single piece of silicon. This silicon is uh, based on the ARM technology, it's an ARM chip, which is what you normally find in mobile technology, but Apple have figured out a way to make it, well, they say fly uh, using their new operating system. So the hardware, the Mac Mini looks pretty much the same. Um, I should point out that this is an entry-level computer. This one has only got 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 internal hard drive. There's no, nothing else going on here. In fact, this kind of also means that you can't upgrade. You know, you can't put your own RAM in it. You can put external hard drives. You can't upgrade anything, pretty much, in this. Or it also comes as a MacBook Air and a 13-inch MacBook Pro. And these are entry level, or for Apple, they're the entry level hardware to their range. There are rumors that we're going to start seeing you know, bigger systems, more pro systems, but obviously we need more software to work in that environment to take advantage of it. So looking at this hardware, we have a gigabit Ethernet port, a bit disappointing that we haven't got that faster uh, Ethernet yet. Um, pair of Thunderbolt 3 ports. Uh, I'm running the, just a USB-C drive on this. Uh, which is a SS, external SSD, just sort of test. We've also got HDMI output, which will run up to 4K. You can run a second 6K monitor out of one of the Thunderbolt ports as well. Two USB 3.1 ports. There's a headphone socket there, and that's pretty much it. Like we say, it's not a user upgradable system. You know, you can buy this and the other models in 16 gig of RAM modes, and also with additional storage but remember when you buy it it's kind of baked into the hardware there's nothing more that you can really do in terms of updates now we are not computer uh, reviewers you know we're not going to be getting into the sort of whole cpu gpu business but what i can tell you about this system on a chip is um, it's got everything built in so we get eight cores in this Mac Mini. Uh, there are four regular cores and then four high performance cores which sort of kick in when you need that extra grunt the GPU is also built in, and so is the, uh, there's some AI, specialised AI area of the CPU, which allows for much faster um, running of AI and machine learning type of stuff. So that might be video, that might be, uh, I guess, isotope stuff when it's, when it's you know, able to take advantage of this new silicon. But what it does mean is the system memory is built in. So, like I said, you can't update that. But what it does mean is that the system RAM is accessible by the GPU and the CPUs and all the other sort of discrete areas of that processor. And that means, because on, on regular PCs, you quite often are copying large amounts of data to another piece of the RAM and then processing on it. What this does is sort of shorten that communication speed, the copying speed, so everything speeds up. You know, that's what they're saying, is this is super fast. So even though we only have a limited amount of software to run it on, let's see what it could do, shall we? So here's my logic session. I've built everything out of U instances of UHE's Diva. All of these, some tracks have got plugins and reverbs and whatnot. There's also uh, a retro synth, which is one of Logic's uh, new synths, and there's also the venerable ES2, which has been around for many, many years. Uh, a couple of tracks on at the bottom. This US, this Diva patch uh, is a Howard Scar patch, and it's quite chewy on the D CPU and you can see I've set the quality and this is across all of the US the UHE instances to divine which is 
the highest quality setting that you can have. Well, generally, what might, people might ordinarily do, if I bring this up again, is run it in um, a lower res mode. Uh, just for composing and then put it to divine for the, the final render because it will be as good as it possibly can But it does mean the CPU gets quite heavily taxed. So if I go back to my I'll Open the CPU performance meter. You can see all the cores are there. Let's uh, close this window uh, Again, I'm not going to apologize for the quality or the cheesiness of the track I was really trying to build as many possible. So I've layered up strings. I've layered up other things So let's start by playing what we got Start off a bit minimal, bring up some more things. This is a, a taxing pan. And all the strings come in, you should be able to see a big jump in CPU. Now you can see the CPU meter is reacting right up there, so very close to the edge. So what I'll do is I've got, I've duplicated that pad at the bottom, which is another two instances. I'd say there's probably about, if you think each of these pads has got four voices, one, two, three, four, five, and then another five or six on here. So at this point, we've probably got five, five fours of 20, uh, 25, 30 voices plus the drums and all the sequences. So I reckon we're up there into about 40 plus Yuhi instance of, of polyphony. Plus, remember, there's some other kind of stuff going on over the whole mix. We've got a, a limiter, uh, which is running across the main stereo bus, uh, which is a look ahead limiter. So now I've switched those other two tracks on. Let's see what happens. Watch the CPU. Well, that's funny because last time I did this, this ran out of CP ran out of CPU. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to duplicate that organ diva track again. Uh, let's create that, and then we'll add. We'll just duplicate that pad, and let's take it out of cycle mode and just play up to just just before we get in. Ah, this is really interesting because this started to fall over and it said CPU overload. I've added another track, so there must be something going on with the buffering where it's knowing what's coming. So let's just add another track again and then come back, run this. Hooray! So I broke it. I feel proud. Um, one thing to mention here is Diva is not actually officially supported under Big Sur and certainly not running natively on M1 silicon code. So that's even more impressive in a way because this is running under emulation and it's not officially supported. Uh, but it does actually bring up that problem that what does work and obviously Logic X is running natively for M1 silicon so we are able to get good performance out of that. But the Diva plugin itself, not officially supported, is also running under emulation. So presumably, if it does have a native version, which will run, I guess it would have to be AU in Logic X that runs natively on silicon, then we might even get better performance. I did find there was a little bit of a bugginess. They did mention something about the arpeggiator. This is for the uh, for Diva, but I couldn't find the bug. But I noticed that when setting to divine mode, if I saved it and reloaded, I'd have to set each instance to divine again. So it's not quite there. I also tried a couple of other plugins from other manufacturers, third party, which just caused the logic session to crash completely, which was a shame because I was hoping to be able to show even more. I, what I wanted to show was like a massive sample library that would maybe somehow really tax that RAM limitation because as we know, some of those can get really big. But again, 
contact is not certified for Big Sur, certainly not for M1 silicon. So we're going to have to wait to get that. Uh, also, I was going to try Ableton Live 11, the beta, but they said no, it's, it's not able to run uh, in a way that they would want it presented on this and I couldn't install it. So there are quite a lot of limitations here with what I can and can't show, but I have got another test. Let me show you that. So I basically went to musicprod.com music and I downloaded these Logic Benchmarks. This is a test that they various run. You can see there's a certain number of uh, benchmark tests here. Uh, the highest being the uh, 28 core 2020 Mac Pro, uh, which gives you 380 number of test tracks. So here's my Logic session. Uh, that I downloaded. This is all just virtual instruments and each track here has an instance of, well if I've, I've got a screen set that will just show them, has an instance of sculpture, has an instance of the uh, EQ, channel EQ, auto filter, platinum verb, chorus and multipressor. So there's quite a lot going on. So if we just go back to our original screen set and then if we look each track, double click here, also has, it's just a sequence of a four note chord. So uh, if I just solo this, uh, actually solo this one, let's just turn this one up, we can have a listen. This is what it's, saying, what it's playing. Yeah, that's fine, and actually just out of interest, that feels pretty. Fab. In terms of latency, we'll just check the audio settings. They say set it to 1024 samples, which I've done. Uh, I've got all the performance calls, you know, in the highest possible way that I can allocate them. Uh, I've got a large process buffer range. Uh, and let's see what we're running here. We have actually, we've got 110 instances. So let's just play that and see how it goes. That's really pushing the CPU. Let's try adding another couple of uh, tracks. No, okay, interesting. So basically, let's try, let's take one down, see if we can narrow it down. So 111 tracks seems to be the maximum this system can deal with. And bear in mind, this is all running completely native. So this is Logic Native plugins uh, in a Logic, which is also native. So this is about as good as it gets on this system. And that's 111 voice uh, uh, tracks. Each track has four voices and there's five plugins per voices. So that is, gosh, 444 voices. 555 additional plugin instances. Remember, Sculpture is a physical modeling one, so it's probably a bit chunky on the power. Um, so if we come back here, what does that equate to? They've actually got a MacBook, uh, a Mac Mini M1 8 core, which is what we've got. Well, look, we managed to get two more out of our setup um, than they did. Uh, but once we, to get above that, it looks like MacBook Air does a bit more, but then we're into desktops and uh, 12 core, 8 core, so these are iMac 27 inch. So we're, we're starting to see this is a system that's comparable to much further up the food chain and more expensive uh, desktop units um, than we would expect with this. So really what we're getting here is actually pretty powerful performance for what is the cheapest M1 silicon they make because this is, this is less expensive than the MacBook Air and also the MacBook Pro. MacBook Air seems to have a little bit more to it. And I'm not quite sure. I think there are differences. I mean, it, Apple explained it. It's that there isn't kind of thermal CPU throttling in this, but depending on the chassis and the environment that this CPU is in depends on how powerful it can be for extended periods of time, because obviously the more cores you use, the more heat you generate. So it's about how efficient that can be. In fact, the Mac Mini has an internal fan and the MacBook Pro 13 has an internal fan, but the MacBook Air doesn't. And in this is, I mean, there's, there's no heat. I mean, there is zero heat and I can't hear a fan either. And these are things which will be important to you. But I suppose what this demonstrates is, you know, considering this is the cheapest level, entry level model, imagine what this would be like 
when they start to bring it further up their product range into their more desktop and their more pro machines, we should be seeing some really outstanding performance gains once everybody gets on board with the right silicon. Now, this is this is the crux of it, really, because we're looking at this somewhat blind. There isn't all that much that is certified to run on Big Sur, let alone the silicon. So, you know, time will tell. If I was to buy, wanted to buy a new computer, personally for me, what I find fascinating about this is I've, I've tried some tests where I've been editing the same stuff like this review footage that I would run on my PC. Struggles a little bit. On here, it was fine. So for an entry-level video editing machine for 699, if I, if, if I could get the 8 gig one to work, which it appears to, because uh, DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut Pro also run natively. There have been tests which show it'll do four, even 8K video playback and editing, which is very, very impressive. But for buying for a system which is ready to go, ready, you know, I have a working system with all these plugins that I use, or I'm running it live and I have all these third party things I want to just let's go absolutely not there's no way that I would recommend you bringing this into a mission critical environment that's using third party stuff we're going to have to wait unfortunately until then but if it does do what you need it does seem like a very good value for money at this present time it's just a question of will it get better are we going to see even more stuff personally I think like I say, for the price, you're getting a lot of potential power there. It's just we're going to have to wait until all of the, everybody else, the rest of the world, catches up and can code for this particular platform. So just coming back to the latency from this keyboard into my main session on the second uh, test session, which was all native. There was no third party stuff. So running under sort of full native M1 compatibility. Um, the latency on the live MIDI input was actually really good. However, in this session, which is all Diva, so therefore third party and presumably using the uh, Rosetta layer, the latency is, is actually quite a lot higher. Um, you can see that that's, and I've set the IO buffer to 64, so it should be really snappy. So I can only assume that's an issue with the kind of whole Rosetta 2 layer, uh, or it might be an issue with the compatibility as yet uncertified of Diva. So just something else to kind of watch out for and reiterate the fact that this isn't really prime time ready as yet uh, with third party stuff. Just a quick word about storage. This base model has 256 gigs uh, built in. I've only installed a few things on here and I'm already starting to feel like I'm running out of space. Uh, you can go up to two terabytes internal storage in this and the other models, but it's quite pricey. I mean, two terabytes will add another extra 800 pounds in the UK to this model. So if you want to run some external uh, storage, you're still going to need something quite pokey. So you want maybe a USB 3.1 compatible or USB-C drive or a Thunderbolt drive, and these can certainly mount up. Samsung Pocket Drives, uh, the T5 and the T7 and the X5 will get you right up there. There are loads of other ones besides. Uh, will get you up to kind of a, a gig a second of transfer, which should see you all right in terms of you're doing video or lots of high track counts or high sample rates, but it does add a little bit extra to the price. It's just not as expensive as the Apple storage. So if I just got a USB 3 drive connected here, let's just copy uh, a 30 gig Halion library across, see what kind of speed we're getting. That's not bad, that's probably looks in the region of four to 500 megs a second, which is decent capacity. And I've also got, uh, if we look here, I've got a network drive, uh, we'll just copy one of the renders of wait, well, this review. Copy this across. It's about three gigs. Actually, also pretty snappy as well. Less than a minute. One other thing you should be aware of as well. Uh, these Macs don't currently run any boot camp action. So if Windows is a part of your workflow and say you wanted to uh, install that on this machine and be able to flip between the two, take advantage of the processing, that currently does not work. Now, I don't know if that's ever likely to happen uh, in the future. I guess it's possible there are builds of Windows 10 that run on ARM chips, but it's a different licensing structure and I'm not 
not sure what Microsoft plans are in that department. I just wanted to flag that up in case it was important to you. So one more thing, as they say in all classic Apple keynote <laughs> speeches, um, it is possible to run iOS apps on this computer. So if I go to the uh, App Store and I'll do a search for, I don't know, Synth. I can also, I've got this tab which iPod add and Pat. So we've got iOS apps showing up in the App Store that we can download here. I did try and search to see if I could find like Core Gadget, Cubasis, so it'd be kind of random running Cubasis, which isn't compatible with Big Sur, or Cubase, which isn't compatible with Big Sur yet, but via Cubasis, which is an iOS app. That would be kind of bonkers. I couldn't find uh, any of those big ones, but what I did find was this synth called Nlog, which I've launched here. And that is basically this, it's quite an early iOS app. Uh, this, I think it was designed to run in the iPad, so this is running and you'll notice that it's actually accessing this as native. And now if I play my... We're getting MIDI control of the iOS app. It's showing up like a regular app. It's just running in a different kind of window. The reason we can do this is because iPads, the current range of iPads and iPhones, use these A chips, which are very similar in architecture to what we've got in this Mac Mini and these new M1 silicons. So iOS apps will, or some of them, will run on your desktop, which is kind of a bit of a mind blown moment. And I guess it kind of signifies that we might be heading into this convergence situation, which people have been suspecting for a long time. Maybe we'll see touch screens. I'm not going to speculate on that, but it's kind of impressive that this runs under the desktop OS, but as an iOS app. Wouldn't it be great if we could run some of these other ones, I like, you know, Core Gadget, like Cubasis, all of these things, as I suggested, Animoog, whatever. Um, I suspect that will happen at some point because that code will just maybe naturally, as it gets updated, will just become compatible. I don't know enough about the ins, uh, the ins and outs of this, but it was a bit of a surprise, I must say, to be able to see that this will work. <laughs> Anyway, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this look. Um, we'll see you all next time. Don't forget, you can support us on Patreon. There'll be extra content. I might put those sessions up there that you can download and try if you've got any M1 silicon. Uh, but thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care now.